Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending the show today. Today's special guest is Ammon Johns. And Ammon is a former contributor to Create a Site Forums. He currently contributes to AmmonJohns.com and ISOSI.com, as well as he does a weekly G Plus HOA here, the, a the ISO I Research Engine. To quote Ammon, he says, Art has always been an interest in his, my life. It is a vital part of who I am and makes me a good marketer. As a child, pencil and paper could keep him engrossed for hours. Given a chance, it still can, though I'd probably sketch more with pen and ink at times. Although his words, he's not exactly an artist, artist Ammon John's was creating artistic work even as part of his work in creating posters, book covers, and other learning materials for schools, colleges, and adult education institutions in London. He also took art in school, getting an O level in GCE. Hi, Ammon, how are you today? I'm great, thanks. Glad, glad to be here. First off, for those that are going to be as confused as I am, what does it mean to get an O in GCE? Uh, the O levels are the, the British qualifications that used to be around. Um, o was for ordinary, and unfortunately that's just the, the secondary school education we, system we have over there. An O level was the, the better qualification at the time. We also had a, a GCE uh, the, the GCE was sort of the general certificate of edu education. O level was the the secondary school level. There's A level, which is kind of college and above level. Um, there was also a GCSE and some other sort of mixed ones, which were much more about uh, coursework and less about what you produced at the exam. So okay. it was just one of those things, uh, you know, with a, a limited ability to take subjects at school, art was still one of the ones that was important enough to me to take. It was one of the treat subjects. Okay. And so now we know what it is. So basically it would just be like our general grade school and high school art classes. Yeah. Pre-college. Yeah. yeah. High school kind of qualification. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. So, um, what about your art has helped you in your business today? Almost everything. I mean, I'm a marketer and people misunderstand what marketing is. And the, the kind of way I try and explain it to people is that marketing isn't something you bolt onto a business. It's a philosophy of business. Um, marketing is kind of the science of business, but it's what businesses used to do is they used to say, right, we can produce this, and then they'd produce it, and then they'd go out and try and find somewhere to sell it. Marketing is taking that backwards. It's saying, right, let's look for a lot of people who are crying out for something that we could make, and then make it. And that's what marketing is. And marketing determines an awful lot of things, but one of the most important things is the ability to connect with people. And art, above all, is the ability to connect with people. So that's how I never it really looked at it that way, but that's pretty interesting perspective there. I like that. So today, as artists become, we've, it's important for artists to become known. Um, Los Elephants calls it the process of who knows you, and basically that's what you're describing marketing is only whether it be a person or in their art or the gadget that they're trying to see if somebody will buy it. Yes, yes. And as you know, with uh, commercial art, there's, there's quite a lot of focus into that kind of marketing. Um, you, if you know that um, you want to sell sculpture for commercial art, then you know there are certain subjects and styles of art that are going to work. You're usually looking at big display pieces um, that are going to look great on a fork or outside an office and it's usually something gleaming and rather sparkling. You're not going to be you know, working in wood so much or stuff like that unless, of course, that was the kind of market you were going for. Um, likewise, there's a lot of artists who 
they may not be Picasso, they may not be Monet, but they have a very good market because they do bucolic countryside scenes and it, it it's something that, that's always popular. Or those beautiful aspirational seascapes and, and boats and you know that there's enough people in boats that there's always going to be somebody buying the art even if they don't appreciate you necessarily as an artist, they're going to appreciate the picture itself because you, you've picked a topic that is commercial. It, it's saleable. Lots of people like it. So I think there's always an element of, of marketing in all art. And then there's the very, very personal art where it isn't so much about who's going to own it. It's about something you need to express, something you need to create. That's sometimes harder to market and that's the one where you really do need to, to build up an audience to build up people who feel a connection to you and therefore that painting has great significance to them because it puts them directly in touch with you. They are part of your story the minute they buy that important piece to you. Okay, I've never had it explained to me that way and that, that's great. I'm sure that'll be a lot of help to a lot of artists as well that will watch this currently and later. Um, we got a couple of connections here. It looks like um, Christian Drysdale is saying that she shared this with 202 people. She wanted to make sure that the people knew we were there. <laughs> wow, that's good. Uh, dogs are acting up. Sorry about that. <laughs> Rachel Alford is waving at everyone. Luke, thanks for tuning in from Corsica, France. And he says hello to everyone. Already, yes. <laughs> New studio may not be as good an idea as I thought it was. Ah, the dogs want to be on, on the show as well. Apparently. Already. Uh, back to some questions for you here, Alman. Um, in relation to this, who knows you? Um, one of the things that's been suggested by other people that specialize in marketing art uh, is a blog for an artist. What would an artist do if they're not a good artist or if they struggle with having topics to write about? What would you recommend? Well, one of the reasons that a blog works so well is it's another way of getting people to connect with you, to understand you. And always, if, if you're not really a great writer or something like that, or, or not too interested in writing, don't think of a blog as a blog. Think of it as a journal. And document your days. Document the inspirations that come to you. And not just the ones that you choose to follow, but sometimes talk about the ones that you have and you kind of think of a concept, but then you put it aside because that's still interesting to people, the ones you didn't follow as well as the ones you did. Um, it's all about being able to put out who you are and how your art works so that people can understand you, so that they can become interested, so that they'll want to be part of that story and ideally be buying that art to be part of your story. I think one of the things that's really interesting is with a, uh, you know, a larger piece, you can actually document the progress of that piece as it develops, and you can talk to uh, to other artists and people who who want to be artists, um, but aren't quite ever probably going to get there, but still love the the feel of it. Talk to them about those days when it's hard to find the inspiration, it's hard to paint, because they're going to understand that. Talk about those days where something goes wrong. Uh, you know, your dog gets into the studio and jogs you at just the wrong moment. Talk about how you deal with these things and that being more human and putting that side of it. So often we only see the finished art. We only see the art that the artist wants to put in front of us. Sometimes by showing the process and the things we don't usually see, there's so much more value there and I think that's a great thing to be able to offer people. And of course, once you've seen that picture taking shape over weeks and weeks, again, you may be quite interested in owning that and that piece of history, that thing that you've understood and it connected you with you on a level while it was still being created. We've lost your sound. There we go. Let's try that with an unmuted mic. <laughs> <laughs> so how, with 
these ideas in mind, how would social media benefit an artist? And which ones, if you were talking to a visual artist, that you would recommend as the platforms they would focus on? Well, certainly, um, Facebook always has the volume, but it's one of those more casually motivated ones. Facebook is really about all of the people you already know. Um, so if you've already got a following, you can expand it quite easily on, on Facebook, and it's going to be you know friends recommending to their friends that they get interested. Of course, as we all know from some of the things that our friends put us in for, we're not at all interested in everything our friends are doing. Sometimes I'd rather not know. Um, but it, it's certainly one of those things and you can certainly build up good communities there as well so you could find uh, a community that was about art and learning art and help out in that and use that to, to get reach. Facebook has a breadth of user that no other platform has and one of the things that's quite interesting about Facebook is it's increasingly getting to be that slightly older demographic that they don't feel quite ready to, you know, Google Plus looks a bit too complicated to them. They're not into the rat race and worried about promotions anymore. They're kind of, you know, coming towards the end of, of that career and starting to look forward to retirement. So LinkedIn isn't something they're really interested in. Twitter, well, that, that's great, but how are you going to use that as an artist? You know, yes, you can talk about very specific moments and certainly when as an artist you've got moments you want to capture Twitter is the one for it because it's all about the moment but certainly Google, Google Plus for me is is the one with the most engagement and the most depth it's the one where people will connect with you on a cerebral and artistic level and I find that not only does work here it's what excels here Google has a platform that's not quite like any of the others. It's a, a collaboration network, and it's much more about the engagement rather than just, here's what I'm up to today. Oh, and here's a picture of my lunch. You know, th there's more to Google. You have to put more in, but when you do, it pays off in such a huge way. Certainly with visual art, I'd certainly look at Pinterest, um, but I find to an extent it's very much about people who like the images, and then kind of look at the pictures and move on. They don't always connect that bit deeper. Uh, Pinterest particularly has a, a much younger demographic. So unless you're selling art that's going to be something that is particularly suited to a young audience, maybe you know something for their first home or something wearable, I don't think Pinterest is going to be a huge driver most of the time. The the main thing I always say with social media is it's it's a great chance not just to talk to people but to listen to people um, so if you start building up an audience and then talk about the kind of art that they like or asking them you know here's two ways I've thought of going with this this piece I'm working on which do you prefer you can get that kind of feedback and, and creative part and of course everyone who votes for the way that you do eventually go is now partly invested in that piece of art again um, it, it opens you up in a, in a whole new way in fact, there's even the chance to, to do very radical experiments, to kind of be somebody's virtual artist. You know, you throw out ideas and I will put it into art as you say it. You could have a hangout where you were creating art from the things people were saying and, and putting in at the time. And who knows whether it's commercial, but it's certainly an interesting and engaging thing that's going to, to get people thinking about art. Sounds like um, someone made the suggestion about uh, <coughs> caricatures, of, uh, specifically of HOA hosts. Um, let's see, it would take a little bit to bring it up because I'd have to open the other the file browser and everything here. Let's see, if, where did I click that? That'll take too long out of the show. I'll have to yep. uh, add it to the show's pictures and comments. But, but it certainly is so that kind of thing, yeah, where you could sketch people on the fly. Uh, you could always, you know, in a hangout like this, have a great guest on and then create a sketch of them at the time. Um, for people whose art was a bit more commercial, maybe more on the sort of graphic design side, you know, exactly the same kind of thing. They could build them a, a custom lower third or they could build them a, a backdrop 
that they could take away with them as, as part of the art process that was going on at the time and, and showing people what goes into it. And of course, when people see these nice backdrops given away, they're going to want one too. So there's always ways of, of doing these kind of things. Um, I think you're always trying to remember what your long-term goal is. Obviously, that's always going to be to sell art. Um, but also bear in mind that there's lots of other goals along the way and just building up that audience and respect is a huge part of that. Not everyone has to be a customer. Okay, Rain Dowell has, is saying an excellent point. People are very interested in being involved in the creation, whether watching live or a recorded video of an artistic piece. A little while ago he watched a time lapse and offers creating an oil painting, and let's see if we can, get, if we can find the rest of it. And creating an oil painting and found it fascinating. So there's affirmation of your point right there. I, I think oil is one of those great ones for the blog as well because it can take so long to work with oil sometimes. Yeah, you, some people can work it very, very quickly, but of course when you're really layering the things and, and you, you've got to worry about, you know, sometimes has this bit dried because I do need it to, to kind of dry before I get this next piece on. Uh, maybe you're doing blossom on a tree and of course you've got a dark colour underneath. You can't go just smearing that light colour on very easily. So, you know, some of those things are the ones where it can take weeks to put a piece of art together and of course that's great for where that journal can tie it all together. Yeah, there's um, some art that I have done. Let's see if I can grab it here real quick. That um, just that layering aspect you were talking about. For instance, this one. Well, it would help if I screen share, wouldn't it? Okay. It's going to be one of those days. Sorry, folks. It's called <laughs> Glitch Day. There it is. For instance, this painting here. I love the energy of that. Is that's all just one paint. In fact, I'm gonna demonstrate how I do that today in the demonstration portion. But that was basically a one day painting painting. Whereas another painting, let's see. The color version of it, however, as you can see, there's layer upon layer upon layer there of different colors. And they, because they're oils, they do have to dry as you step them forward. Yeah. It's, it's amazing the difference in feel between the two versions that it, it's almost, you know, a completely different subject because of that. That powerful color of the yellow. Just with, just with the yellow, it just has a an instant impact, you just feel it more. Whereas the second piece, it's more about the thinking. And I, I always love that about art, that some of it is cerebral and some of it is just hit you in the chest feeling. The, um, <clears throat> on this doing with social media today, I like to say that we need to be human to human. I think in a lot of your shows, you've kind of expressed the same point as well as some others. So, and this is especially true if we're trying to sell our ourselves. So what advice would you give to an artist just starting out on social media? Um, I think don't worry too much necessarily about the audience you have. But always try and think of the perfect example of who you want to be talking to and then talk to that person. And you'll find that this, this wonderful thing happens where somebody will pick up the other end of that conversation. So when you're first starting out and you don't necessarily have anybody on the other end, if you talk to the person you want to be there, then the kind of people who are going to respond to that and follow you are that kind of person. It's, it's just putting out a resonance and people that are on that frequency are going to tune in on it. 
So I think that's one of the very first things. Know who you want to speak to early on. Know who you are and who you want to be speaking to. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It will happen because you're doing it on that wavelength. After that, I think, you know, it is one of the, the things, uh, that advice that our, our, our parents used to say to us, you've got two ears and one mouth, spend twice as much time listening as talking. Let people ask you things, get people involved, and, and spend most of your time listening. People never get tired of somebody actually interested in hearing about them. And, of course, you know, we all want to talk about ourselves as well. But if we listen to them, they'll very soon be saying, oh, I've, I've been talking about myself. Please, ask, tell me about you. And instead of you having to kind of start that conversation, oh, well, I am, which turns a lot of people off, you've started a conversation, you've got them engaged, and now they're asking to hear about you and to learn about you. And the more they do, the more they're going to want to know. You've built an instant rapport. So, yeah, be human but also be that good listener. I like the good listening part. And that is, I found, and maybe you find this true even in marketing, that if you listen and become a people watcher, their expressions, their movements, even if they never say a word, they help you understand more about their feelings and in marketing, probably like your art, you can bring in those feelings into what you're doing and projecting and never really have to say a word to them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and besides everything else, you know, you've never in your life heard anybody say, Michael, you listen too much. It, it's one of those things, you know, <laughs> the better you are as a listener, the more people will generally you know, like you and enjoy. It's a rare skill. Um, yes, there's also a lot to watching. There's so much of, of communication is unspoken. You know, I've heard in the past, uh, admittedly on specific cases, but they say as little as 7% of our communication is in the words. So much of it is in the tone of voice or the way we address something, our body language. There's so much more to it. And of course, context and, and what's going on around us is a huge part of our communication too. Words are absolutely the, the very minimum part of it. I like that point and that's very true. Let's see what have we got here for Zara approves of your comment here. It says Am and John who you want to be talking to it works. Good to see Zara's tuned in as well. Yeah, especially since she had to just run over here right after midweek zap. I know. I uh, guess I should have planned a little ahead and scooted me back a half hour and give her a little more time. <laughs> then I could have caught the show too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as it is, I get to go watch replays. So we have someone from Naples, Florida. Oh, no, Welcome, there's a sitting Arthur back Moorhead. He says he just got home and he's thanking Kristen for the invite. He's an artist as well. And we're glad to have you here, Marth Arthur. And feel free to join us and pitch with the, in. The with comments. the name not being a traditional Italian name, I'm kind of thinking that, that he's on the Grand Tour, the artist Grand Tour, off to explore. And uh, that's always a, a fantastic point. Of course. We don't all have to go to Naples, although we might all like to, but uh, even taking time out of your, your ordinary day-to-day -day life and just going that little bit further afield to get inspiration is a, a fantastic thing and it's something that's a true of, of marketing as it is at art. I very consciously make sure that I don't spend all of my time focusing on marketing books and marketing blogs. Um, I go a lot further afield to draw inspiration from. And I, th I think that's important for any kind of art and any kind of career. Cross-training, if you will, for your brain. I like that idea, cross-training. Uh, we can focus too much in, and as a person, it's too easy to zero in on self. One of the things I like to do is get out in with other people what they're doing with their activity. Um, it may be an activity that I'm 
not particularly fond of, but just watching their enjoyment of it and their participation in it if it's a given activity that uh, sometimes can bring even inspiration that you wouldn't get just being home. Exactly. You, you, if you want to experience something new, the best way to do that is to go somewhere you don't usually go, not somewhere you do. And uh, whether that's a, a sport, an activity, whether it's with people you don't usually uh, hang out with. There's that wonderful film, of course, that uh, Jim Carrey did, uh, where you know he's not allowed to say no for for a long time. And Yes Man was the the name of the movie. I think that's a wonderful thing that we should all take on board. Maybe not to that extent, but I, if nobody does anything else from this hangout, one day per month, spend a day of yes. Open yourself to new things. Don't turn down those odd ideas. Say yes, whether it's to others or to yourself, and go and explore new things and let that serendipity come to you. I like that idea. That's pretty neat. Um, Kristen agrees with you here on the power of listening. She says, right on, Ammon Jones, the universal language of listening is powerful. And it is, it, very much so. The, uh, as we've already discussed, there's just so much that you gain by listening yeah. when you learn to shut up. Let's see. Do you have um, any other topics you would like to cover that I didn't ask you about already? Um, well, I must admit, most of the, the the kind of things that people probably want to know about marketing and art are, are going to be either people who are marketers and tuning in for me to see what I say about art so they can better market their art clients or people like yourself who are artists who would just like to get that little bit extra extra handle on, on how it goes and the, the key is to tap into why people are buying art and one of the things that, that we discussed on a, on a show recently with the, with the Susie thing was that thing of the story one of the things that, that people always latch on to is stories if you look at anything unknown we create a story for it you know, all superstition is to take something unknown that maybe is worrying and therefore we create a story for it. And even if it's a scary story, we feel better about it. Stories are just right built into us. They're, they're so much a core part of, of who we are as, as human beings. So the way to sell art, whichever side of the uh, sales equation you're on, is to understand the story. The story of the artist and the story of the, the piece of art. Um, get into what was the inspiration for this piece? Um, what had brought the artist even to this point where this particular inspiration wasn't just something that, that occurred but that motivated them, that moved them? Maybe it's a, you know, a feeling you've had before and addressed with previous art. What had changed? What, what was the position of this? And the story of that piece, your involvement in it, your legend, if you will, turns that work into not just a piece of art, but legendary, literally, in, in every sense of the word, legendary, it's got a story behind it. It's something to belong to. It's something to be inspired by. So story is absolutely the key to selling art. And art is feeling. Stories are feeling. Put the two together. Got a lot of comments going on back and forth in the audience today between Kristen and... Um, our visitor from Naples, Florida, Arthur Moorhead, he's, um, he was just asking to check, catch up, to stay on subject, is it about marketing? And Kristen replied that, well, let's get it highlighted here. It's, I like how she put this, the beauty of blending an artist with an SEO marketer, a wide range of perspectives. Another feed the welcomed questions. Is there anything you'd like to throw out there? Invite, and we'd like to invite everyone there to do the same too. We're at the halfway point where even if you have questions you would like to ask Ammon or myself, feel free to write them into the comment stream and we'll be glad to address them. 
Yep, absolutely. And as, as I, I'll put in the comments elsewhere, you know, even if we don't get to all of the questions, I guarantee I will come through the comments and answer them after the show if we, if we miss any. So let's see. Does anyone out there have any questions for Ammon Jones or Johns? Pardon me. I know Ammon Jones as well. My brain is dancing <laughs> around on you. Sorry about that. While we're waiting for them to get a chance to type one in, if they have one, here's one from Cheryl Deuce. Always been taught that if you can possibly say yes, you should. And that's an interesting perspective. It goes in line with what you were talking about earlier. Positivity is, is a very, very powerful thing, not just for yourself, but also for, for those you interact with. If you're seen as a positive person, it makes others feel more positively about you, and it, it just, it, it's karma. Um, it, it's karma in this lifetime. It, it's something, you know, we like to be around positive people. Can-do attitude is something that we, we, you know, put as a very good thing out there. And I think even if for good reasons you're continually saying no, less and less offers will come your way, less and less opportunities will come your way. So, yeah, if you can say yes, say yes. Well, there seems not to be any questions for today. You must have answered them all already. <laughs> what I'm going to do is... In line with where you were talking about storytelling, I'm going to show a painting and a little bit of storytelling here. Excellent. Come up. There we go. This one. Okay. There it is. Oh. Now, this painting is uh, called Octopus's Bedroom. Mm -hmm. Do you see the octopus in there, Evan? No, no, I don't think I see anemones. I see shells. I see I see wonders. It's it's an absolute grotto in there. I'm not quite seeing the octopus. Of course, I've got it on a small screen at a little bit of a distance. But I give you a hint. You, everybody see the mouse? Look right in here. And especially right there at the point of the mouth. It's hiding under that lid. Uh -huh. Now that painting started out as a story. One day, one of my grown sons was whistling the song, Octopus's Garden. Now, us old-timers automatically think Yellow Submarine from the old Beatles animated movie. And that thought hit me. It said, you know, there must be a million paintings about the octopus's garden. So I Googled it. Sure enough, there's just tons of them. But they're all animated, just like the movie. Mm -hmm. There were a few photographs, but you couldn't see the octopus. So I said, well, what does an octopus's garden really look like? So I went out, and I started doing some digging and saw the different areas and the different type of plant life around. Most of the pictures, though, showed the fauna and other animal life around them, but not the octopus or his bedroom. And I finally found a painting. A photograph where the octopus was shown with just some of his leftovers that he didn't eat, the shells and the outside of the crab claws and stuff like that. That, um, But all these plant life that you see around the outside edge of the, were all in the little coral nodules that they hide in when people come around. And I said, well, what a neat idea. I'll take that and paint their natural habitat around them and that's how this painting came about. The shell down here in the foreground, that's part of his leftovers. There's a piece of shell there. There's actually this 
this one back here is buried in the sand. Um, they're very trashy around there. When they finish eating, they just throw it right out the front step there. Just, uh, I don't know how else you'd describe it. <laughs> they're just a big, basically, trash pile around the front of them that you wouldn't normally see from a distance because all this other animal life and plant life is out kind of hiding it because they're out enjoying the water and feeding and everything as well. And that's how that painting came about. Okay. Cool. You're, you're less corny than me. You see, I'd, I'd have probably gone for one of those sort of Japanese style gardens, you know, with the, the stones all neatly arranged. I'd have, I'd have had it divided into eight sections. <laughs> one for each arm and, and had you know a new legend of, of the octopus's garden and how it actually kept eight gardens and just I, I love creating stories so you know it, for me it just would have been a, a completely different and probably much cornier way of going I, I really like the colors in that that was beautiful that that would make an interesting subject I can picture it in my mind when you see the octopus there with a the little arm in each one but you would almost have to make it animated to a degree just to make it fit. And I think I'd almost go for, you know, that kind of um, blue ink Chinese or Japanese style of art. I think I'd go for that, static. But again, yeah, the, and then um, the Zen garden of the fact that, that it's done. It just, it, just to me, that's, that's the way it immediately pops into my head. Well, there you go. There's your next creation when you're not busy doing the... Uh, Marketing. Let's see, did we get any questions here? I've got a comment to my work. Okay, Kristen has a comment here. About this. Not a question, just got to say you're doing a terrific job with integrating Comment Tracker. Well, thanks. I'm working real hard at this for a one man show. And as Ammon can tell you, that's no easy feat. No, it isn't. And thank you, Arthur, for your comment. Do you have anything else you would like to add, Hammond? If not, I'd I guess love we'll to know, go a little early. If we have time before the show ends, Arthur, if you can tell us what kind of art you 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 uh, you work in. Do you work in oils? Are you a, a pastels guy? Uh, is it sketching? You know, we, we'd love to know uh, what kind of art you're doing. If you can let us know in a comment before the end of the show, we'll uh, we'll try and catch up. Well, I got a few minutes here yet before I do yeah. get scheduled in the. Uh, yeah, but now we're putting him under pressure. He, he, he's an artist, not a typist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, and the thing about it is, is I've been thinking that I need to do a "Who is this guy?" type video. The, I'm an oil painter. Um, I like landscape. I like a little bit of different creative. Um, let's see if I can find one like this one. Like this one. This is what got me back oil painting again, and my wife told me I couldn't paint in anything else after she saw it. And this one too has a story behind it. This one is called Horses in Heaven. It's kind of a fantasy reality type painting. This one. It's done in oils as well. I love the feel of oils. Um, I can paint in acrylics. I can do watercolors. I do sketching, charcoals. But oils are my favorite medium. This particular painting was inspired by a, another artist, oddly enough, a, an onstage artist. He's a ventriloquist, and he has a regular show out in Las Vegas by the name of Terry Fader. Now, for those that don't know about Terry Fader, he has a set of ventriloquist dummies, just like Jeff Dunham, different personalities, different. The difference is, is there's very little dialogue between them because his puppets sing. Now, I've always known it's tough enough to be a ventriloquist to talk and throw your voice, but this guy actually sings using ventriloquist dummies. 
Well, he put the dummies down, and he said he was going to do a special segment. And he starts to tell this little story about this little segment that he had in his show that when he got booked into Las Vegas, they told him he couldn't do anymore. This is, this is Las Vegas, boys. They just won't understand that kind of thing here. So you got to remove it. So he did. Went on and did about his show. Well, this was back October of 2012. And... In September, that I saw the show. In September, he'd had a little boy out through Make a Wish. This little boy didn't want to go to Disney. He wanted to go see Jeff Fader live in Las Vegas. So Make a Wish brought him out there, got him in the front row seat. He got he took him backstage. He did a private show for him, give him some of the little stuffed puppets that he had as promotional items. And the little boy was just happy as he can be. And he went on back home, and he was terminal cancer. Well, just before the show, Terry Fader got a phone call from the little boy's parents. The little boy had passed away. Now, just before he started telling this story, about 15 minutes, the wife and I had received a phone call while we were at this concert, and we had found out a dear loved one had died. So Terry Fader put this song and this piece that he had taken out from Las Vegas back into the show that night in the honor of that little boy. Even in his videos that he sells, this segment is now back in his show. And he tells the same story about the little boy. The song was called Horses in Heaven. It's about a little boy whose friend is dying, and his friend wants to know, are there horses in heaven to ride? This painting blinded me. I couldn't see the stage. I couldn't see the audience. I couldn't see my wife sitting beside me. I came home and for the next two weeks, this is what I worked on. I couldn't wait on it to dry so I could go the next step. It was just so hard and so much for me to want to be poured out. And you know, the sad thing was, is I offered this to Terry Fader through his website, but I could never get past his audience. This painting, if someone doesn't buy it before then, if Terry Fader ever asks for it, it's his. I don't care if he pays for it or not. But that's the story behind that painting. It's it's a beautiful piece, and uh, and your story too. Uh, tell, Tim, if you if you ever give up art, you you've got a job as a storyteller. I've actually done some publishing. I've was published in a uh, science fiction anthology as one of the attributing artists or authors rather in two thousand nine, called the Sci Fi Almanac. It's an annual anthology that they put out. And I was in the inaugural edition. Excellent. So you'd that's, think that's I'd do better thing. with a blog, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, th I think you've just got to find find your connection with the blog. You just you know find what you want to do with it. And once you do, I think you're going to be absolutely away with it. And uh, but this is it. Yeah, tell those stories. And uh, certainly, if that story isn't on the blog, Tim, get it up there this week. Because that, that's a beautiful story for a, a beautiful, beautiful picture. I'll have, that's something I hadn't considered, but yeah, I guess I should get it up there. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that insight. We are at the three-quarter point, and now you get to see me play in my dobs. So I'm going to turn on that camera over there. I'll be back in a minute, folks. Turn this camera off. Doesn't need bandwidth. <laughs> and okay. 
So this is the bit where Tim does all the work and I get to sit back having an easy time. Yeah, can everybody hear me okay over there? Yep, loud and clear, Tim. Okay, because I didn't know how that was going to work. We're in a new studio and new area here. Um, yep, it's working. <laughs> Just got a blue box, that one now. Yeah, I guess it's using this computer as the boss, <laughs> even though I started in the other one. Now we're using the color raw sienna. Uh, wait a minute. Help me turn on my lights over here. There. I bet you can see it better now, can't you? Now you see a little bit of what I'm doing. Yep. The color is raw sienna. And we're also going to use. A little bit of yellow ochre. I like to work in single colors. And my brushes are way over here. Got to figure out a better solution for this camera. And, and the brushes I want here. This one. And that. Just four brushes. And the reason I was digging around in the drawer over there is because I don't like to store my brushes up in like that because what happens is they'll flay out and spray out like that. So I store all of my brushes flat, just in the bottom of the drawer, just like that. Okay. And this has actually got to be, when I finish up here today, I'll have to uh, continue it after the show, because that'd be it for a show tomorrow evening. Just put a little bit. So there's not actually a whole lot of paint on the paint at this point. Because basically what I'm doing right now is I'm just drawing. But I'll do a version of that yellow one that I showed. Here's the the pole there. This particular paintings are of a sport that is played by the Native Americans of the Chickasaw, Cherokee, Seminole, Creek, and Choctaw. It's called stickball. This particular version with the pole, um, the Choctaws actually play the game as a... Uh, with the pole in match play. Let me just touch a little person here. See it? First here, we're just kind of getting an idea of where we want people. So we're not using a whole lot of paint here. The nice thing about the raw sienna is whether, and the yellow ochre, is whether I decide to go with color or a monochrome like this is a, it's either a good color for the monochrome or it's light enough that if you put colors over it, it covers it up so I can do my layouts and not have to worry about worry about whether or not I'm in the right place here. Because I can just kind of do a, a bit of an idea there. Let me try to jump here a little bit. I'm going to do things a little different than the other picture. We're going to make all of his appointments here. 
are going to be female. Because in the Creek, Muchi, Seminole, Cherokee, at the beginning of the year, they play games, the men against the women, and let the women get involved in it. And then in the fall, they do what they call match plays, which are mainly men. And the problem with that is, is it gets so rough that it's not really safe for the women to participate. So this way we can get the ladies in here too. And in a fun game, even the Choctaws will have the women join them. It's only during their match plays that they set the women out. Because actually stickball has an interesting origin. It started out as a way to avoid fighting between the villages and tribes. So you just it's just like drawing, you just lay it in there. Just a little bit. It's a little big on purpose because that's actually our focal point. So now I'm going to reach up here. But I got the paint in there. I'm going to pull some off because I will shadow that in the finished picture and make it more round. So as you can see, this young lady is a little closer to the front here. So she's a little taller than the guy there. But she's going to make sure if he knocks it away, she's there to get it back. Now, the Choctaws, oddly enough, are the only ones where the women we we'll use the sticks too. In Creek, Seminole, Cherokee, um, possibly Chickasaw. Fall out of my part. I need to double check that for the story of it. There, the women actually do not use stick. They use their hands. Now, the men can only touch that ball with the stick. Whereas the women can pick it up and hit the ball. And way up here on top, and that needs to be brushed. Put the ones on. Let's get that picture over here. Let me get that real quick. Way up here on top, with the Seminole, it can be different things. With Creek and Choctaw, it, on the traditional grounds, it tends to be um, skull, and usually a cattle skull or a goat. But most of the time, it's actually a cow skull with horns. Often when, when things have a, an element of the skulls and things like that, it's uh, to do with fertility and, and you know, bringing life again in death. Is, is that kind of thing part of this ritual as well? Um, it could be. Um, what I've been able to find out about the game, it hasn't actually been stated. But I do know that the men-women matches only occur in the spring. And Yuchi, they don't play stickball. They do what they call it, the uh, Indian football. It's mm -hmm. um, kind of a flat, oval-type pillow of, that's made of leather and filled with leather. And but they have a stick pole, and there's a livestock on the top of it, too. So. It's very highly possible. 
I can't give you a definitive on that, unfortunately. I think with the with the spring, it, it could well be because there's always so many things about you know waking life again after the winter. Uh, in in our own cultures, you know, there's things like the May dance and the Maypole. Um. Well, even the um, rabbit and the eggs at Easter are still symbols of renewed life and fertility. Most people aren't aware of that because. Of the uh, Christian association, and there's actually more to it than most people tend to realize. So I Let's see. I'm going to put another one back here. Just to kind of sketch it in here. And this is one of those type of paintings that, you know, it'll go fairly quick. This one, I'll finish up tonight. We'll be able to use it tomorrow. Do you have a whole image in your mind when you first put the, the you know, the pole in with this, or do you explore the space as you go along? Um, I basically, when I start a painting, I can see the finished product in my mind's eye. I know what I want to see. And some of my most popular paintings that have sold were actually paintings that I was disgusted with the finished product, but those were the most popular. So it doesn't necessarily mean my eye is as discerning as the viewer's. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I know how that can be. Uh, the the piece I had to do for for my exam when I when I did art, I I I chose painting. Uh, I actually worked in watercolor, but I had this terrible accident days before uh, the the exam, and uh, some glue got spilt onto the painting. And in trying to work that out and paint over again, when I'd been working in in watercolors was really, really problematic. And I'd, I'd got a, a scene which was uh, a kind of pagan scene of people dancing around a bonfire uh, because I wanted that energy and, and primal feel to it. I wanted a, an image that just hit you straight away when you saw it. And what I ended up doing was, was kind of using this mistiness that, and powdery feel that the glue had added to, to create smoke for the picture. <laughs> and in the end, it, it got complimented as one of the great effects. I, I don't know how you got this smoke in there, but it's great. Well, it just goes to show that that's one thing that I have to agree with um, the old television painter Bob Ross. Is he called them happy accidents. And that can be very true, that's what they, as far as what they are. I, that's a good explanation. I don't know what else you would call them other than happy accidents. So that, and oddly enough, it's usually those happy accidents that you didn't want in the painting that are most usually done. It looks like we're running out of time here. But that's just basically how I'll start a painting, um, depending on what it is, um, what color I will use. Um, next thing I know, people are going to ask me to do whole shows of how they do the paintings. So uh, let's see here. Let's... There we go. Um, oh, it helps turn the camera back on, though, doesn't it? You can turn that one off. There we go. Alrighty. And we'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, I know last week I promised showing you some oil pastels, and Kristen was kind of excited about that. We'll have to do that again another day because of the need to do these paintings this week. I thought it was appropriate to go ahead and add that to the game today. Um, yes, Arthur, it's very similar to tetherball, except there's no string on the pole. <laughs> Alrighty, Ammon, I would like to thank you 
for your time this afternoon. And Pleasure. this evening for you, it's got to be getting close to bedtime over there. Uh, it's 10 p.m., so I've got a couple of hours yet. Yeah, the hard part of the work day starts staying up and getting what done before you need to go home, huh? Yeah, uh, <laughs> always the <laughs> way, and uh, getting ready for the next day as well. If anyone has, let's see here, helps take that off. There we go. If anyone has any further questions or anything they would like to see am an answer or myself a dress and demonstration or a painting or whatever, be sure and let us know in the comments. We thank you for your uh, tagging along today. It's for a very informative afternoon with Ammon. And is there any closing remarks you'd like to add, Ammon? Uh, only that uh, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. and. Uh, I'm subscribed to the comments, so however long it is until somebody manages to catch this video, if somebody finds this in search results in a year's time and still wants to add a comment, go ahead. If I'm still around, I'll answer it. Right, thank you very much for coming today, and thank everyone for watching. And this is another episode of What the Art, the HO with Heart. And the heart today is the center. Of, for independent living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They're here on Google Plus. If you type plus the center, it comes up and be sure and tell Aaron you said hello and that uh, if there's anything that you would like to do to help out those disabled rehabilitating, these type of facilities are ideal for it. And Aaron can clue you in on the different things that their agency does. And we'll make a special attempt to get her on here one of these days, but they keep her pretty busy. And till that time, you have an enjoyable evening and the rest of your week, and we'll see you next Wednesday.